Hey everyone, um, I honestly don't really know how to start this video because this is gonna be a video that is really bad. Base, uh, I'm just gonna mention it, IGN re released an article how hidden Nazi symbols were the tip of the toxic iceberg at the Life is Strange developer Deck9. And this talks about how Deck9 and Square Enix and a bunch of people felt it was a horrible work environment within the Deck Nine company as well as um, their relationship with Square Enix. And before I get into this video, I do want to mention that there are projects that are announced here or it confirms that there's going to be a next Life is Strange game and a next Walking Dead game. but. I will briefly mention them in this video because I don't feel it's appropriate to talk about that type, um, that kind of topic in something as serious as this. I will be making separate videos on those two, um, on those two games later. But for now, I do want to talk about the seriousness of what's happening at the Deck 9 games with the employees. So we'll be starting off with the article. It does mention here that early last year, while working on the next entry in the Life is Strange franchise, Deck 9, people, the developers at Deck 9, know something about that shouldn't be in the game, and it mentions Nazi symbols. They also mentioned about the number 88 and some stuff as like racist memes, the number 18, and so on and so forth. And there's like even like a moment in the game where there's like a dog whistle to white supremacists. So this does confirm that there is a new Life is Strange game. I got a little bit confused at the article because I first thought this was talking about Life is Strange True Colors and no, this is like actual like unannounced projects that have been leaked by multiple employees in this article. So they tried to mention this to management. It mentions here that management remained silent and staff unrest grew because this was something that happened multiple times and it wasn't like a oopsie, we probably should not put that. It seems to be a problem that they were purposely ignoring. It even mentions here how um, the C-suite has protected multiple abusive leaders, encouraged crunch, and allowed bullying of individuals advocating for more authentic representation in Life is Strange. And something with Life is Strange games is that Life is Strange, they're definitely known for like talking about like heavier subject matters. While I will admit there's some stuff that I wish they would do in a much better sense, I would say for the most part, at least the original game did showcase on like mature themes and it was an interesting tactic for them to go with, especially during at the time because I think Life is Strange released around 2015, the first Life is Strange game. So I'm all for it, but like at the same time, there needs to be like realistic standards on like what's appropriate and what's not appropriate on like, is this really necessary to the plot or like what does this add to the story? You know what I mean? Now, it has been happening multiple times where there uh, have been gaming companies that have been like employees, ex-employees, or employees who remain anonymous that mentioned about poor management. But something that's like really crazy with this so far is that Deck Nine Games seems to be in a big shithole of a situation. And that's something that I find really disturbing about the situation compared to other situations that that for example like maybe the only problem is just crunch time and there's like nothing else but this is a whole lot of this is like a lot of like overwhelming stuff that i've noticed within this article it mentions here about the crunch time that i just mentioned earlier and that um employees had to work 70 to 80 hours a week for an entire month straight on true colors Something I want to mention is that it's obvious that it's obvious that Life is Strange True Colors is not a high budget game compared to like other Square Enix games compared to like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth for example. Based on what the article has said so far and just like me knowing how game company works somewhat, 
obviously Life is Strange is probably like the least priority within Square Enix, which is why they probably gave Life is Strange to Deck Nine Games, who were, I believe, a new company at the time, or they didn't work on that many games, at least not any big titles I'm not familiar with. But yeah, especially with COVID, I think COVID was in the way as well. Um, Life is Strange 2 Colors, they were definitely like more of a crunch time. It even mentions here, um, much of the crunch developers say it was a direct result of the relationship between Deck Knight and Square Enix. Several people told me it felt as though Square Enix has sold Life is Strange to the lowest bidder. It's what I just mentioned. Uh, multiple people were aware of producers being forced by their bosses and Square Enix to rework production schedules so it looked like every milestone fit within a very limited development time frame. Despite their arguments that it was possible, one called Square Enix, and specifically Square Enix London and Deck Knight who were directly bullies. Life is Strange is a Square Enix own IP, but sources tell me Square Enix seemed oddly reluctant or outright hostile to diverse themes and the ideas that Life is Strange fans would love. For instance, multiple people called an incident during True Colors development, where Square Enix told multiple developers it didn't want Life is Strange to be thought of as the gay game. I'm mixed about this. So for me personally, I'm part of the LGBT community and I do think representation really matters a lot and I think representation needs to be represented in a good way. And something I do dislike about certain game companies is that they force representation where they don't add like a lot of backstory to it. It just feels like they just made the character gay just to like add representation when there's so much to like being gay like a background it doesn't really feel like they fully develop like these characters out like for example i could think of is probably like riverdale for example where there's this character called kevin and he's known as the stereotypical gay guy and that's all he is in the show so i don't want to say that's what square enix thought of because i honestly don't know i think most likely what square enix thought of was um hey we need people to like buy our games, so we kind of don't. We kind of have to avoid saying that it's a gay game because it might turn people off. That's what I'm assuming is like happening with like how Square Enix mentioned this game. Obviously, I was not there, so I can't like pretend I know like the context of the situation. But it's most likely Square Enix most likely did it in a negative intent just to make sure that their game does sell well, especially since it's like a lower budget. Even our press guides were not to say anything about Alex's sexuality, period, at all. There's a lot of pressure out there praising True Colors for having the first bisexual lead in a Life is Strange game. A narrative designer who worked at Deck 9 on multiple Life is Strange styles, even at a press guide from Square Enix, all the way up to um, review copies. We were not to say anything about Alex, Alex's sexuality, and they did that um, they did the advanced copies. Uh, and all of these reviews came out saying how amazing it was to finally see uh, explicitly by um, protagonist, and after that, Square was just just kidding. Alex is absolutely canonically 100% bisexual. So yeah, it is Square Enix's fault for not trusting the developers, especially since this was a big deal for Life is Strange in general. We technically had bi characters in a Life is Strange game, but I think what makes True Colors different from like the first game and the second game, I think the first game did not really reveal it until like the fifth episode, and then Life is Strange two. They did it like midway through the season, but I think for like True Colors, it was like already established and it came out as a full game. So I think there was just like a lot of more, considering this is like a main entry to the game and not a spinoff, I can understand like why this is a big deal and that this should be a big deal, honestly. They said that managers at Deck 9 never seemed to willing to ask Great Enix for more time or push back the notes on the developers disagreed with. How then was Great Enix even supposed to know the studio was struggling? That's an interesting point. This is something with poor communication and Square Enix I'm, are like the higher ups of, the, of Deck 9 games. So because obviously they're publishing their game and I'm assuming that they're helping with funding per se. And with Square Enix, obviously they're not going to know everything that's happening. But I think it's really bad. I think it was really bad on Deck 9's part that the managers over there did not really communicate with Square Enix, being realistic, being like, hey, we don't have enough time. We need to do something about this. We need like more time or we need more people to help. I think that was like the biggest issue. It's just like poor communication, at least for part of this uh, issue that we've noticed with the crunch time. However, many developers told me Deck 9 management seemed unprepared for dealing with the game with serious themes, especially when it comes to thoughtful portrayals of diverse individuals. So something I do want to mention is that in Life is Strange Before the Storm, that's a game that was made by Deck Nine Games, um, it's kind of clear that Deck Nine doesn't really 
there is like some unprofessionalness in their serious themes where it doesn't seem serious at all. You could technically say that the first game had some like cringy lines and that it didn't feel serious at times, but I feel like for the most part from my, what I remember from the first game, I feel like they were able to like tackle a serious theme, especially during the time, I feel like it was like 2016 when it wasn't, I don't know, I was pretty young, I think it was like 2015 or 2014 when Life is Strange 1 come, came out, but for the time when that game came out, the serious themes were really serious and I thought they did a pretty, a pretty good job with like dealing with the theme of the situation that was happening in the first game. When Deck 9 Games made Life is Strange Before the Storm, I noticed that a YouTuber actually mentioned a scene where, um, I believe it was Rachel Amber, um, she actually can drug Victoria in a scene in Life is Strange Before the Storm, and there's like no consequences whatsoever of her doing this. <gasps> Touché. What? It's actually pretty crazy because this is something that I feel like not a lot of people really thought about and I know for me I did not really think about it too much um, when I seen the scene or maybe I didn't get that scene I don't remember because it's been a while since I played before the storm but it's actually really really weird how Deck 9 never how they dealt that game in like a silly format of a serious theme of a minor being drugged just for her own personal advantage to get into a school play while we still while the game still takes place in the same universe where in Life is Strange 1 Mr. Jefferson drugs all of his um, underage victims and murders them that's something that I find really really crazy to think about and it was like something that was mentioned by a YouTuber as well I'm not sure if I mentioned that but a YouTuber mentioned about that and I thought that was a really it was a really good review. I'll link it down below if you guys are interested. But I thought that review was really good just because I never really thought about it until that was mentioned, obviously. These include a number of specific accounts of sexual harassment, brawling, transphobia, and otherwise toxic work, co um, work culture that multiple individuals corroborated. In one example, multiple people remembered a senior programmer who frequently made sexist remarks and crude jokes with both racial and sexual overtones. One person recalled him repeatedly harassing a young female producer, frequently speaking over her, invading her personal space, and blocking her from grabbing items. He also frequently screamed and swore at other junior programmers sitting near him. One anonymous source with inside leadership decision recalled management fighting to keep the programmer despite numerous reports, opting to move his team to his desk far away from other departments so others couldn't hear him yelling. He was eventually let go not too long after the incident where sources recall overhearing him screaming at HR representative. So, this is something that, it's really, it's actually really disappointing to see how this is like a reoccurring um, behavior with Deck 9 games. This is not something that happened to like, let's say, one individual. It's like all parties are like really involved in like all these situations. Every promotion where a woman got promoted took a team effort. Everyone suggesting them, sending emails, both men and women, dozens trying to get them promoted. That's where the harassment and sexism really plays in with how most of the team members were treated. While these water issues pervaded the day-to-day -day of the team's work, sources say Narrative faced internal conflict as well as largely centered on its leader, Narrative Director, and eventually Deck 9 CCO Zach Garris. So, in case you guys don't know who Zach Garris is, I don't really know him too well either. It actually mentions that he joined Deck 9 in 2016 as a narrative director for Before the Storm. I knew this way long time ago just because I've seen him in like the trailers for Life is Strange Before the Storm, True Colors, and I believe The Expanse as well. Um, he did play a large part in those games and I guess the start of the Life is Strange games um, after Before the Storm, or I guess during Before the Storm. But yeah, during True Colors, it mentions that Garrus began forming relationships with a number of younger women, often in situations where he had some sort of mentorships or other powers over them, including at least one of the women on his team, 
Multiple women describe him as love bombing when they first met, showering them with compliments and convincing them he could get them promotions or raises. Sources say he frequently stayed late at the studio talking to these women, inviting them to lunch, dinner, drinks, movies, or even to his house after work. While in all these situations, sources say he would instigate personal conversations and would even text some of them after work hours about personal topics. And this is one of the situations that was mentioned. He would walk me to my car. I'd open the door, say goodbye, and he sort of linger. Later, Tim recalled. We'd keep talking, i sit down, and he'd linger again uh, next to the open door. He never made a particularly over move, it was always subtle enough. It felt like it was maybe always just a vibe that I was just getting. I felt stupid first of all, and for ending up in a situation with him in the first place, but because he never clearly made a move, maybe I was just reading too much up into the whole thing. It wasn't until I explained it in great detail to others that someone um, clued me in. That's something I find really disturbing about this um, situation as well. It seems like later on, um, Garrus is going to be mentioned a whole lot and this is going to continue. But yeah, there was like multiple issues with Garrus that was like mentioned here and get, um, Garrus did not really care about representation. At a certain point our job became finding a way to couch feedback in a way that Zach would hear more than it was coming up with the feedback Littleton added. So. Garrus did not really respond well with feedback in like how the game should go and would like really would want to do like his own version of the game without hearing like what anyone else has to say. And this definitely involved with True Colors a lot with the development. I would say before the storm they get impacted as well just because there's some stuff I know is in the game now and I wouldn't be surprised if Garrus hadn't influence but true colors as a main entry was mostly talked about i believe in this article others recalled um being reprimanded by garris for asking about the removal of a transgender character from true colors that took place fairly deep in development two anonymous individuals told me that when the deck nine social team wanted to post something in support of black lives matter garris pushed back calling black lives matter a hate group in another example, multiple people told me that Garrus fought hard for a twist on True Colors' final choice that a number of writers point out included a problematic portrayal of migrant workers and needed to be changed, and it eventually was. So, uh, Several sources recalled a meeting in which Garrus had told who pushed back on the decision as they were getting too hung up on political ideologies and asked everyone present to go around the room and list their political affiliations. That's something... That should not be done in this fucking studio. I'm sorry. Like, it should not be done. I find it really stupid that Garrus mentioned about Black Lives Matter being a hate group because there is more to the Black Lives Matter just in history in general that still continues on. So I find it really gross that Garrus would mention this in within the company especially. I think it makes it... This adds on to like... Not the work environment not being a safe environment for everyone and it's really surprising that Garrus was still allowed to be in the company and you would think that after multiple complaints that there would be consequences but it doesn't seem like it um, later on in the article which I will mention. So in the final scene in Life is Strange True Colors, the main character Alex, she's been t taken to the woods by Jed who she thinks is a friend. Um, Jed betrays her, shooting her and missing, causing her to fall into the abandoned mine shaft. It's really weird because um, I noticed how weird that scene was. Actually, I'll mention after. However, in Garrus' original version, Jed spikes her drink at a bar and takes her out to the woods for an attempted murder. When they saw this version of the scene, a number of people pushed back, arguing that the scene would unintentionally trigger association with date rape. Multiple individuals, including a number of women, recalled having to fight extensively with Garrus about the scene before it was eventually changed. I've always noticed that that scene was weird in my opinion just because I think it was really weird how Jed like missed shooting Alex within that scene and the context did feel a little bit like it felt rushed I would say like there it felt like there was like a change in the story and this actually makes a lot more sense now with how it was originally supposed to be and it's really nice that there's multiple people within the team that like can express their opinion about this sort of stuff because Obviously, Garrus probably doesn't know what the hell he wants. He just does because he just feels like it. He doesn't think about like experiences or whatnot. But what makes the, um, the development team so cool and creative is that it's a team effort. So 
the fact that multiple people were mentioning how this scene doesn't contribute to the story they mentioned later on here that it took three hours in within the writing's room and it's given space to breathe about the scene and it wasn't about not wanting us to t have difficult topics in there and this detail is irrelevant to the plot that's basically the big deal about this it's really cool that the development team can just say their opinions about like what they think is not good or right and then they all kind of have to agree on like the direction they want to go with and the fact that Garrus was really difficult to work with is definitely really gross i really don't think it's appropriate at all i think definitely everyone's voice should be heard especially with something like a heavy topic like this and the fact that he didn't really care is really really disgusting and it's something that i'm not i'm really disappointed with him as well as square enix or i don't know who's like the head i i know how some of this stuff works but i'm assuming square enix is in charge of deck 9 so it's kind of like square enix's fault for not doing something about this behavior or maybe someone in like the department of deck 9 i'm not too sure because i'm not too familiar with this i am familiar with like some stuff within the gaming industry but i'm not i'm not gonna pretend i'm a professional and know like how the hell stuff these types of stuff works she added that once Garrus finally agreed to take out the detail out he went on on a long tangent about how the writers need to be creatively brave enough to go to ugly places for the sake of our art and um, another anonymous source we call Garrus suggesting that this was a pushback was only occurring because he was making a game about a woman and he wouldn't have to deal with this if he was making a game about Nathan Drake. Drake. All the stuff people have praised in the queer community about True Colors was hard, hard fought for, Tate said. Um, Garrus had senior queer people on his writing team that he refused to trust. The theme of the game is empathy and the power is empathy, but he didn't really have any of his own. He would talk about how he felt so empathetic to people, but he generally seemed so repelled by any experience he could personally identify with. If someone talked about their life lived experience as a marginalized individual, his response was, is that true? This is... I don't even know where to go with this because this is so ridiculous. I think it's really ridiculous because of course there's a lot of people in the True Colors dev team who are part of the LGBT com um, community and the fact that they're not able to create their um, own character like Alex Chen because it's a team effort but like Alex Chen is supposed to be a representation for bisexual people and the fact that they're not able to do that is actually really gross and how developing the game was a nightmare in hell. That's something that I find really gross about this. All the stuff people have praised in the queer community about True Colors was hard fought for. Tate told me that she went to HR repeatedly about Garrus' behavior during his time there, but was simply encouraged to try and see things from his point of view. Another source close to the leadership was aware that Garrus hadn't been instructed to aid by HR to stop taking a young woman out to dinner. And he did not, however. Those I spoke to say that as True Colors wore on, Garrus distanced himself from the team of writers. He had another lead would make most of the story decisions. Um, rewriting work up f from other writers, allowing them the opportunity to get feedback even on stories centralized, um, centering marginalized characters. Towards the end of True Colors, Deck 9 implemented a new anonymous performance evaluation tool as a result of a number of people told me that they finally felt comfortable enough to be honest with the management about Garrus' issues, but management they say did not, did not take action. Sometime later, Garrus quit voluntarily and then Basically, that was part of the story. But yeah, later on, um, the narrative team erupted. Multiple people begged management not to bring Garrus back. In a series of meetings, messages, and emails, one person familiar with leadership at the company recalls HR stepping in, knowing that management was actively underpaying a number of workers, especially women, while considering a massive salary for Garrus. HR allegedly suggested that Deck 9 could be allegedly liable for Garrus' behavior if they invited him back after the Beffy reports when... Um, the company CEO, CFO persisted in arguing that they needed Garrus' multivirus handed in resignations. Um, finally, Manch um, relented, Garrus did not return. This is where things get interesting because um, Deck 9 Games actually worked with um, Telltale Games to work on The Expanse. This led to Garrus working at Telltale Games. What the fuck? Like, what the hell? I don't even know. This is. It's actually really insane how it's... I'm, I'm just gonna keep reading. Only a few months after his departure, several of those who have protested Garrus' return were told that a few narrative team members had been holding a story-breaking session at Garrus' home. Um, and then later on, 
there's actually a statement i think this was Oh yeah, this was a statement made by Telda Games, which I found it really interesting that Telda Games mentioned it, but I'll mention it in a second. Telda Games mentions that they're not aware or of any concerns about Zach prior to his hire, and declines to comment on internal Deck Nine issues. They also knows they also mentioned that they had to move remote and hybrid work during the COVID nineteen pandemic, and they said that we can say that during the time at Telltale, Zach was one of the most talented, balanced, and inclusive game directors we ever ever, ever worked with, and that is evident in the games he has delivered. This is a little bit concerning because it sounds like Zach could still possibly be working with Telda Games, which is why Telda Games most likely is saying like a positive comment about Zach because he's like, I don't know if he's going to be working with them on The Wolf Among Us 2 or um, it'll mention here in a second. I, I, I probably should wait. I know I'm getting too ahead of myself, but basically the point is I don't know if Zach is still working with Telda Games just because he worked on The Expanse or if their relationship was actually good. It's really hard to tell, but I feel like most likely what happened here is that I think Zach is still working with Telda Games, so it's most likely why Telda Games chose to comment. And they could have declined to comment, but I find it really interesting that they decided to comment on the situation, especially with their collaboration. In response to a request for comment on this piece, Gareth pushed back a number of allegations above, though he acknowledged having mentored many women. He also mentored many men and never directly offered promotion but instead supported the existing promotion process. He says that the team at Deck Nine was very close and often attended lunches, dinners, drinks, movies, and other engagements together, and that he hosted get togethers at his home a small number of times, with both male and female devs, and that his 73 year old mother who lives with him was always present. He added that he never engaged in a brand or inappropriate behavior in texting his coworkers and that many devs in the studio text often about all matter things. Gary's mentioned about how the narrative team on True Colors was initially characterized by torpor rather than toxicity due to a small portion of the group not collaborating well. He said, in all my years of in my all I can't talk. In all of my career, I have never worked with writers who are creatively inflexible, antagonistic towards difference, or less inclined to listen or compromise as a select few of this group. Garrus claims that the work on True Colors prior to his presence on the team was so poor that the game was under real threat of cancellation when I returned, and that at a certain point he chose to reduce the influence of certain members. He claims that as a result, their contact became unprofessional, more antagonistic, and accused Terry towards me of the toxicity that, from the perspective of many people in the studio, was actually a result of the behavior. And it just mentions that Garrison mentioned about the Black Lives Matter group as a hate group, and he made an effort to handle the discussions and all that about working on the final ending or he denies about the rejected story angle in the life is strange ending um for true colors and he mentioned that they also had to work um during remote so there it was pretty hard to like you know meet people face to face um especially with like or especially with like having to meet people at their home instead of just like it's just how, how it had to work. It's really weird to see... The fact that Garrus responded is really interesting because this creates a scenario where who do you believe? Garrus or the multiple people that mentions about Garrus' behavior? Considering that there was multiple people that complained about Garrus' behavior, I do think that it could be possible... Gar I think it's most likely that Garrus is in the wrong and that he most likely was... Be he did have like poor behavior considering this was like a habit that was happening around deck nine games it's hard to tell though about like the employees because obviously i'm not going to pretend i know the employees or know the situation too well but considering they're speaking from their personal experience it's clear that something did happen and garris i i, I do want to believe that he did try to like save life of strange two colors but it's kind of hard to believe when he seemed to like be struggling with like when he seemed to like a little seemed to be a little bit more complicated in terms of like developing the game and it could be possible maybe he was the issue it's hard to tell it's really hard to tell but yeah he also mentions about all this um this is something he mentions about how he was proud to be part of the team and the game and then work closely with him and about optimistic future work and then he just mentions about the queer and trans of women of color are just writers of colors who are not typically comfortable able to be at home in the game industry just because the way that she continued. Zach left, we managed to reshape the story. This is just something you guys can read if you guys want. This is a lot about what Zach said. I believe it's what Zach said. So, 
end of 2022, the new Life is Strange game, basically, it, I, I'll call it Life is Strange 4 for now. Life is Strange 4, um, they had like inappropriate stuff that is considered as a racist meme. I'm not really going to say it. You guys can just see it here. And then just mentions about the number 88, which is a reference to Hitler, number 18, and so on and so forth. They even mentioned about a scene from, oh, I think it was like earlier, never mind, my bad. Um, meanwhile, concerned staff were forced to contend with the notion that a co-worker was using Life is Strange to promote hate speech. Multiple people told me that while they could easily believe someone might accidentally and instantly use the number 88 or 18 without knowing what it meant, the sheer number of races and Nazi items in that one room made it difficult to believe that it was all a big coincidence. So, it mentions that HR investigation was ongoing, but there's no feedback about it. I'm hoping that there's something done about this, considering that this article went live, and I'm assuming something does have to be done, considering Deck Nine Games and Square Enix honestly just look really bad right now, and they 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 have they have to respond. There's nothing they can do. They really do have to respond to the situation that's happening. One anonymous person pointed out that the given particular fan base Life is Strange served, having imaginary like this seemed uh, like a recipe for certain disaster. To put that in this game in particular feels targeted, they said. It feels like a way to say you don't have to this either. It's not a little thing, it's meant as a joke, it doesn't matter, it reads the same. Oh, okay, I missed that about the article, my bad, but they did mention that um, the symbols were removed in the game and management determined that this was not intentional action, which is a positive it's not really i'm it's not really good that it had to get to that point but i'm so it's not it's something i'm glad that the next live strange game won't have it won't feel like a hate speech game like it mentions um it doesn't matter if we accidentally put such symbols in the game unaware of their meaning if some segment of our audience perceived them to be espousing hate speech it mentions here that just multiple employees were just feeling uncomfortable about the situation and it mentions about the lack of transparency around the investigation, and this is something that's like been a reoccurring, a reoccurring theme that it doesn't seem like there's like proper communication, especially with the Deck Nine company and just with Square Enix in general. I'm assuming it's because Deck Nine is seen as like a small company, and I'm assuming Square Enix does not really care, and if they do care, it's just not a big deal to them. So it's really sad that that's a thing here, but. I'm hoping moving forward that there will be like more communication within the company and the fact that it's happening in 2024 is really gross. Um, you would think that this is something that happened like a while ago, like maybe like let's say 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but the fact that this is something that's like still a reoccurring behavior, it's really disgusting and I'm hoping that there's like, I'm hoping more action is taken just to make sure that everyone's safe and that they feel like they can be in a safe environment, get the paired hours, and not have to work overtime because game development is hard, it's not easy. But yeah, it just mentions that Deck Knight will be investigating the incident further and it just mentions about the log group and the situation. And then later on, um, Deck Knight was being rocketed in other ways. In spring 2023, basically the studio had underwent two rounds of job cuts. The first smaller one um, was impacting single-digit number of individuals, and in May, Skybound Entertainment canceled a deal with the studio to work on a sequel to Tells Us the Walking Dead, and it mentioned Skybound declined to comment for this piece, um, which I find funny. Roughly 30 people across um, all Deck Nights pro um, project lost their jobs, and reducing studio to around 100 people. So this does confirm that there was a Walking Dead sequel. It actually mentions that... Um, um, Deck Knight has been working on pre-production script for The Wolf Among Us 2 and Telltale was having their own money issues and they were getting funding from Deck Knight Games and I find it really, it's really interesting that they never announced this um, but I think they lost their, they mentioned that they lost their partnership I think, I think they lost part of this project, I think it's somewhere here I think it doesn't really mention it but, um, but basically um, if what in this article says is true, which I think it is, considering it's coming from multiple people, there was going to be a Walking Dead sequel, um, Tuttle was Walking Dead sequel, so there was going to be actually a Walking Dead Season 5 with Deck Nine Games, um, but Sky Na Skybound cancelled the deal with um, Deck Nine Games um, to work on this. What I'm assuming happened is that I think Tuttle Games are working on Walking Dead Season 5, and because Skybound did fund them like $8 million, I believe, in like one article. So I think Walking Dead Season 5 is supposed to be like a really big game. Like this is like a big budget game. 
but they're not gonna announce it because the Wolf Among Us 2 um, got delayed. It even mentions here that Wolf Among Us 2 got delayed, um, or it doesn't mention here per se, but like it mentions that they were having issues with the script production, with pre-production, which is why um, it's taking a little bit longer than expected, which is why the Wolf Among Us 2 has been delayed for a lot of years now. Um, here is Zegnai's response. I'm not gonna read it. You guys can read it if you want. It seems to be just like basic stuff that they just like just wanted to mention. It actually mentions here the cancellation of the two major projects. Um, Wolf Among Us 2 is not cancelled by the way. It's just that Deck 9 games don't have the rights, which is why I think the Walking Dead sequel is still happening with Total Games, but obviously they just cannot comment on it, um, which I find really interesting about it. But yeah, they were impacted, they got their cuts paid, um, their pay cuts, cuts, paid cuts, I I'm so sorry, I'm like, I'm not good at English, it's really bad. I worry that tr um, True Colors and Before the Storms are important to the queer community, and I worry people will think that it can't play these anymore, but every good thing we got in those stories was fought hard for by female writers and queer writers, and games are made by one person. If you're marginalized, you have to love so much to make them, because you have to put up with so much more shit. This was a lot to take in, and this article was extremely long by the way. I was really surprised with how much is in this article on like, I guess, on the history of Deck 9 games and Square Enix and the relationship and how um, working on the Life of Strange games was a living hell. It is really disappointing to see how this is something that did happen and multiple people spoke up about their experience and Deck 9 games is definitely under a lot of fire right now. I'm assuming Square Enix is going to be on fire as well just because of their relationship with Deck 9 and Square Enix. But this was something that I did want to mention and this was, it's an interesting topic to talk about and I'm really glad I got to cover it on the channel because I didn't think I was gonna, I was debating if I wanted to do it or not because I know this is not like um, a happy news video per se but I definitely think it's really important to talk about something serious as this and it's not something I'm hoping that moving forward, I know it's not going to be easy. I'm hoping like the next Life is Strange game and maybe the next Walking Dead game. I'm hoping Life is Strange is in a... Um, I hope that they feel more comfortable working on Life is Strange without feeling that there's like a lot of pressure and like, you know, the targeted hate group obviously within like being the, within like within the game. That's definitely stuff that I don't think is necessary, especially if it doesn't relate to the plot. I'm kind of glad that Telltale Games have been treating their employees, at least from what they said, um, good and that there hasn't been any crunch time so far because that's something that they did promise. Because that is something that did happen within the old Telltale Games company and the new Telltale Games company can't really do that, obviously. Or they can't do it in general, but like, they can't do it again if that's what I mean. So, I'm not sure where this is going to move forward. I do want to talk about this a little bit more with some stuff um, that was mentioned in this article but I'm gonna save those for like another videos just because I don't feel like it's appropriate for this video per se but yeah this is gonna be it for the video it's a little bit of a long one I'm gonna edit it down it's most likely gonna be like 35 minutes I'm not sure it's really long it was a little bit overwhelming just to go through the whole article so um, I would love to know your guys' opinion about this and I would love to hear your thoughts about it but yeah if you guys did, um, if you guys did enjoy the video, it w I would appreciate it if you guys left a like and subscribe. It would help our channel a bunch. Um, and that's gonna be it for the video. So I hope you guys did enjoy, and I will talk to you guys more about more gaming stuff that I'm interested in. So yeah, I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.